Hello and welcome to the program. Our guest today, the General Superintendent of the Elam Pentecostal Movement of the United Kingdom. That's a mouthful and a half, but he's a big man for the big job. John Glass, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Gary. I don't imagine when you were a child that you looked in the mirror and said, I want to be the General Superintendent of the Elam Pentecostal Movement when you were grew up. No, I certainly didn't. And it wasn't until probably just a few months before I assumed the role that uh, I ever took it on board that that might be a possibility. So at what age did you have a sense that you were going to do what could be referred to as God's work or Christian work? My father and grandfather were both pastors and my grandfather was an evangelist and I gave my life to Christ in a tent crusade that he had when uh, uh, he was in Salford, Manchester. Uh, Salford doesn't have too many green fields and so um, the tent was put upon a redundant car park. Uh, there were many people who gave their life to Christ that, that night. I was one of them. And when he came down off the platform, he saw me in tears and, uh, and he thought that I hadn't received the little gospel he used to give to everybody, little gospel, New, New Testament he used to give to everybody. But the fact was, at that age, at just about five years of age, I was just amazed that this person, Jesus, loved uh, not just uh, adults, but boys and girls. The gospel was put so simply to me, and I was just overwhelmed by the thought of it, and I gave my life to Christ at that point, and it was really childlike faith, because obviously, at that age, you don't know all the ins and outs of what it is to be a Christian. But well, that was my first encounter with the gospel. Well, they say you've got to be childlike to be able to understand and to yeah. do this, but what level of understanding do you think there was at that age? Well, he, he had the ability to present the gospel so simply, and I just understood that... Uh, Jesus loved the world, Jesus died for, for us, and that if we, could, uh, if we committed our life to him, he'd come into our life and uh, give us a purpose and a destiny. And that's about as much as I think I understood. Um, I wouldn't like to argue that uh, you know, I was born again at that moment, but that was my first um, response to the gospel and my sort of spiritual awakening at that young age. A lot of people say that at some point in their life they have a experience where they meet Jesus in, in one form or the other. Mm. Did that happen to you? Just after I'd made my decision to follow Jesus in that very simple way, about a year later, I'd be just six or seven years of age, I uh, got out of bed one day, getting dressed to go downstairs and uh, for my breakfast. And over, we lived in a large house with very tall, uh, tall ceiling rooms. And over the door of my bedroom, it was probably about six foot from the top of the door, to the ceiling. Uh, I just had a vision of instantly knew it was Jesus. Uh, all I was aware of, he was wearing to me strange clothes. It wasn't a scary thing. Uh, the Lord didn't say anything. I've never had a vision like that since. Um, and I saw it just for a while and it faded down from the face down to the feet. And I just took in that he was wearing strange clothes. I went downstairs in a very matter of fact way. He said to my mum, mum, I've just seen Jesus in my bedroom. And she, I can remember now, she didn't seem taken aback. She asked what he was wearing. And I thought that was significant because it was strange close to me. And when I uh, described it, I was actually describing the high priestly garments of Jesus. And what was very significant, I found out after that, that my, her father, my grandfather, the man whose ministry I was saved under, he had that very same vision in that very same way when he was called into the ministry. So as a small boy, I just assumed that God's hand would be upon my life. Um, I don't, for those who are watching and think, well, uh, you know, if I get a call to the ministry, must it be like that? Of course not. Um, that was very unusual, um, and, but that's how it happened for me. And John, have there been times over the years where you've had to come back and, and hold on to that experience? I think there are times in all of our lives when the importance of call is really fundamental, not just that moment, because that was in my very formative years, but later when that call was confirmed, later on, um, when you look back in times of difficulty within ministry, as it's inevitable, I've been a, a pastor for 40 years now, uh, there are times when uh, if you do get any doubt, anxiety about your own capability and that kind of thing, or you're under pressure or stress, then sometimes you go back to the moments of real encounter with God. And I don't think that's just the case for pastors. I think that's true of every one of us who are born again Christians, uh, that when we, when we sense that God has saved us and we belong to him, that's a great anchor when things go wrong in our lives. In trivial pursuit questions in church groups, sometimes the question, what does Elam mean, pops up. Yes. 
Can you be on my team if that comes up, please, and can you answer the question now? <laughs> well, somebody told me it was on University Challenge the other, the other week, actually, <laughs> that question. I don't think anybody got the answer right. Um, Elim was an oasis in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when um, probably two million people were trudging through the wilderness and they were short of shelter and they were short of water. And they came to an oasis and uh, there, were, there was shelter, there were palm trees and there were 12 wells of water, one for each tribe. And so our founders, uh, way back nearly, nearly 100 years ago now, about 95 years ago, they felt the world was a bit of a desert for people, a bit of a wilderness. And what church should be, should be not an institution, but an oasis. And I don't think the world is any less a desert today than it was then, and probably it's more a desert than it was then. And so Elim is, uh, if, if you were to go out now, you wouldn't find a, a, a place called Elim. It's actually called Wadi Gurundal. And I'm ever so glad that we don't call ourselves Wadi Gurundal <laughs> Pentecostal Churches. <laughs> so the site is Wadi Gurundal, but the original place in the Bible is Elim. John, I'm intrigued to see that you're a blogger and have been since 2006, mm -hmm. which makes you a reasonably early adopter of that technology. <laughs> is the internet important? I think it's very important for communication. I think everybody realises that, not just churches, businesses, individuals. And so, you know, I, I would be on Facebook, on Twitter, on, on blogs uh, and things of this nature. We did podcasts uh, for all my leaders. Uh, we used to send out a, a, a minister, and I still do actually, send out a letter to the 950 um, credential leaders, uh, pastors and so forth in the UK. Uh, but we now supplement that with a, a podcast and later with a video cast. So it's much more intimate to do it like that. So I have the, I have the blog and then we have the podcasts that go out on to all our leaders as well. So, so why do you blog? Well, uh, my particular blog is to do with where I travel. We have a magazine that uh, is read by directions, read by I think 20,000 people each month. And, um, and those are different families with mostly within Elam. And there's a, a page on there called Travelling with the GS and I outline the places which I go to um, each week and talk about the churches and their pastors. And I often put that first in the blog so immediately people see within probably 48 hours of me speaking in, in, in a church, either in Elam or outside, I've put that in the blog. It takes probably about two months to get it into print. And so it, it, the blog is just a way of talking about where I've been and and different expressions of church and so forth. And not, and it's a, immediacy. It, it creates an immediacy, really. And a nice photo of you on the blog as well. Oh, so, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so how important is it that you think as Christians that we interact with people using the internet in this day and age? Well, the gospel is about communication and we can't reach people we can't touch. And so every way we can touch people, uh, whether it's by preaching, speaking, blogging, uh, being on Facebook, being on social networking. We try to be more a river than a road. So a road says this is the way we do it, this is the way we plant church, this is the way we disciple people, um, this is the way people grow in church. And so you put the railway lines down and, and then if you have an obstacle to that, you have to stop the train, get off the train, remove the obstacle. If you're a river, you just flow around and find another way round, another way of planting a church, another way of impacting people's life, another way of communicating, we just flow round it. And that means that older people, older leaders like me, uh, need to have a lot of young guys, uh, and by guys I mean in a generic sense, men and women, around us, and I'm fortunate to have that, uh, that so that we're just looking intuitively and creatively uh, and radically about just the way to be church. So how do you blend the flexibility with the theology? Because the theology, I guess, hasn't changed in 100 years. No, the theology, yeah, it, doctrines are eternal and uh, traditions are temporary, and we discard anything, any, any tradition um, that is a hindrance and a stumbling block to, us, to our main purpose. And our main purpose is reaching people for Christ, uh, growing healthy Christians, and one of the big deals within our, the denomination that I represent is building bigger people. And uh, we talk a lot about that. In fact, the strap line, the subtext to all of our Bible weeks or conferences, whatever the theme might be, it's strap line is building bigger people, um, even before building bigger churches. Because if you build a big church, and we're fortunate to have a number of um, many churches of many hundreds and several of over a thousand in this country, uh, that, that's great. But you can have a big church numerically, uh, but its impact upon the community can be uh, millimeters thick. And so if you build big people, then big people grow things around them apart from being growing themselves and you stop being enslaved to statistics. And so what do you think are the three main points in building bigger people from where you sit as the boss? 
Well, if you ask most people to measure the height of a tree, you give people um, a tape measure, whatever they use, a yardstick, um, and say measure the height of the tree, most of them would, would, uh, would go out and they would put it, settle it on the ground, take it to the highest branch and uh, that would be the height of the tree. But of course that isn't the height of the tree. Uh, the height of the tree, or uh, the size of the tree, is from the lowest tap root to the very highest point. And so in building bigger people, we're not concerned with externals which can be measured. Most of the important things within the Christian life and in ministry cannot be measured. You can't tick box about a man's integrity, a woman's integrity, their heart after God. You can say how many are in church, how big the offerings are, how, much, uh, how many buildings we've got and that kind of thing. But the important things are the invisibles. So building bigger people has to do with the invisibles. I mean, you come from New Zealand. I was in Auckland at the time when the America's Cup was taking place and... Uh, the pastor of our church in Auckland took me down to look at the yachts and I was surprised how close you could get to these things. You know, the whole uh, future of the pride of a nation depends upon these, this craft and yet I could just, you could reach down and touch them. And, um, and then there was a commotion around me, a commotion and uh, everybody, there was a lot of noise and something was being lifted out of the water and what was happening, they were taking one of the yachts mm. out for repair and people were rushing in smaller craft to cover, is it the keel underneath, uh, to, to cover it so that no one saw it. Because the secret of the speed and success of a winning craft is not uh, how well it's, uh, how, how cool it looks, uh, the colour of its sail, it's what's hidden under the water. That is where it wins or loses in the invisible area. And that was a huge message, that the invisibles in our life matter more than anything to God. I was just doing, we have prayers at our international headquarters. Uh, on a Monday we start the week with prayer. And I was sharing yesterday with the staff. And uh, I was talking about the time when uh, Samuel goes to Eli's house and all the guys who they th look like kings uh, weren't the ones to be anointed, but uh, there was this little lad out there who hadn't even started shave shaving. The Bible says he was ruddy of complexion, overlooked. And David was brought in, David was anointed, and this very telling message was, don't look at externals, God looks not on the external, God looks upon the heart. Let me just tie the word missionary into this now, because you yeah. talked about this, this, your school training missionaries. Mm. Define a mission, missionary for me in 2009, 2010 words. Well, I believe that everybody who is born again, who found Jesus Christ as their saviour, is a missionary. Uh, God has given us a mission, mission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. That might be our village, it might be our school, it might be our community, um, might be the places where we work and live. Um, so really missionary is what we're all mission everybody's a missionary everybody's a missionary uh, some people are specifically called for longer or short periods to go and work overseas but when they come back from overseas they don't stop being a missionary they just be a missionary in a different um, context in fact the idea you know that we've got this christian country that we send people out to uh, to share the gospel with the dark world um, you know that that's a slightly victorian in in the context that the church has always been an alien country in whatever in fact if we're not we're doing something wrong you know we're citizens of heaven and if you think we, we live in a very godless culture and just being a christian in the uk today uh, is to be countercultural. Uh, and we, we count, we, in fact, if our lives are not countercultural, we're not living a Christian life. Taking your point that we're no longer a, in the United Kingdom as Christian as perhaps we may have seen ourselves in the past, does that cause you grief? Are you worried about that? Um, I'm, I'm concerned about what appears to be um, a work within media and within politics to marginalise the church. Um, I don't lose any sleep over it because um, I've read the end of the Bible, as we all say, we win. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I do believe very strongly that, you know, no one is going from an external position, going to marginalise us at the end of the day. Uh, but the fact that people should take upon themselves with an, with an agenda to do that uh, is, co is curtailing the freedoms of Christians to, to operate uh, within their local context. So it, it distresses me certainly when I hear uh, marriage guidance counsellors uh, 
who are sacked because uh, they don't want to suspend their Christian principles in order to do their job, or probation officers, or or nurses, and you know there's horrendous stories of people who uh, have just prayed with a distressed elderly patient, and uh, and have been put on a disciplinary charge. You know those kind of things upset me for those people, but in the the bigger picture, I don't get distressed because I know the gospel in every culture, in every culture, every time, always wins through. The Christian Church is stronger in the Soviet Union uh, and in China than ever it has ever been in, in as, you know, since the uh, in, in the last thousand years. God will build His church. He says, "I will." God, Jesus says, "I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it." And so, although in the short term you're concerned about what's happening by legislation and parliament, etc., in the bigger picture you're not too concerned because whatever persecution we might face at the moment is nothing compared with what's going on in North Korea and in various parts of the world in Sudan. Um, and if these people can break through that kind of bondage, the Bible says the word of God is not bound. You can't bind the word of God uh, you can, any more than you can, um, you can hold wind in one place and air. You can't do it. And the Holy Spirit will not be bound. The word of God will not be bound. And the church will always be built. It's exciting. And I'm ever so glad to be alive at this time in uh, this part of history when the church is doing such great things around the world. Here in the United Kingdom, there's, there's a lot happening with, with other religions mm. asking for higher profile and, mm. and higher responsibilities in different areas and, yeah. and even saying that maybe we should adopt some of their legal practices. And, mm. How do you counsel Christians to deal with that in the United Kingdom? I think what the, the position that I would want to take would be to expressing love, Christian love, and, uh, and grace to everybody, whatever background they're from. And I think that we as Christians should be doing that. And, you know, it could be argued, it could be argued that the state of the church today in its weakness as in, in contradistinction with other denominations or not denominations but faiths uh, may have been because we haven't been the salt and light that we should have been uh, over a generation. And so the challenge in us, in us is to do better and be better and to live what we believe. Um, and, but it, I, I'm not, I, I think the church gets itself always into a conflict of grumbling and complaining. Um, it's probably not an expression of the church I'd want to identify with, but I do believe that we should speak into those situations to make sure that Christians aren't marginalised. So is the church in the United Kingdom in good shape from your perspective? The church is, is, is the church and is not just what we brand by our denominations. The lovely thing in the Old Testament, you know, that people say, why don't people, of Christians who are born again, why don't we just sort of suspend all our labels and just be the body of Christ? And you know, if you look at the Old Testament, nowhere does God say, no, listen, it's very, very territorial to be Dan, Naphtali, Gad and Asher. You know, let's just take away all your tribal names and just be called the children of God. He never asked that. What he said, and this is very important, I believe, that he said, be proud and work under your banner, and under the label, if you like, your brand of, you know, Judah, whatever. But when you camp, camp in relationship to one another and make sure that the tabernacle, that's where the special presence of God was, is always in the centre. And when any denomination or stream tries to take that central position, you know, we're the coolest people, we're the most important people, we're the people who've got most favour on our life, then we've actually supplanted where, what God wants us to be. And so God says, yeah, be the people of God. Um, you know, if you be a Baptist, be a great Baptist. Your Anglican, be a great Anglican. If you're Pentecostal, be a great Pentecostal. But relate with one another. Recognise the unity that, you know, that we might be one, Jesus says, uh, as a trinity is one, but always keep the work of the Holy Spirit and the centrality of the gospel and the vision God's given to his church in the centre. And so we can work under our streams and labels, but we also give primacy to the Lordship of Jesus. I think that's a, a good model to work forward. One of the, one of the many jobs that you do is, is go to other countries mm -hmm. with Elam. Yeah. Uh, does it surprise you when you go to those countries to find that, that God is as real and relevant there as he is mm -hmm. here? 
Yeah, well, I go to some countries, Gary, and uh, I, stand, I see the commitment of people who haven't got our resources, haven't got our facilities, and their ministers hardly get any income. And I almost feel I'm not a Christian compared with their standard of godliness and righteousness and the anointing of God upon them, which is a very strong lesson to the church over here that we don't depend too much of this in the scaffolding of our resources. And uh, God is doing incredible things around the world, and it's very humbling, particularly in the third world, uh, when you see the, the, the grace that's on, the, on, on people who are committed to God and what they're accomplishing. And there's phenomenal rates of growth as well, particularly in Africa. A lot of Africans could quite rightly say that, that we, the supposed nice part of the world, have done some terrible things to them. Mm. Yeah, well, a little while ago I was um, at a d day off. I was speaking out in, uh, in a number of meetings in, in Ghana. And on a day off they took me to the coast and uh, they took me to what I thought was going to be a, a photo opportunity. I had my camera with me. And it was a castle on, on a, right near beautiful golden sands and lovely blue seas and palm trees. And uh, what I saw inside that castle just blew me away. And actually it was one of the most powerful spiritual moments in the last five years in my life and I, know, I can almost say in an, almost in a negative sense but then in a positive sense I went in there and it was this place apparently had been used as a place to, as a conduit for bringing in slaves and exporting slaves I was taken into an underground chamber um, it was it looked to me as if it would it, a seat if it was a church building 300 I was told that a thousand men would be there without very little light chained together uh, not seeing outside light for up to six weeks. Um, their food was brought to them where they were. There was no sanitary provisions at all. They could not leave where they were. Can you imagine that? And uh, it was horrendous. And there was about me and about three or four friends who were, who, who were there just standing in there thinking the misery and the horror of that situation. And you may think, well, that was the thing that was the spiritual, mm. you know, um, eureka moment for me god talked to me about the the horror of slavery but the worst part for me was when i came out into the light and remember there's only half a dozen of us and it was claustrophobic a thousand people in there you know you just can't imagine it came into the light and just almost as an afterthought the guide said oh incidentally you know see that building over there a couple of hundred years ago that's where the uh, that was used on a sunday by the um the slave owned the masters of the slave traders not even the masters slave traders and so i pricked my ears up obviously think i can't but what do you mean for church services and gary to my horror i found on a sunday morning the slave traders and their families would dress up you know we're talking about 150 years ago 200 years ago whenever it was and they'd go to church and they'd enjoy listening to Bible readings, singing hymns, and a few metres underneath them were a thousand men, and there was another area where women were, a thousand women were there, but a thousand men in chains, in misery, just beyond themselves. And without sounding sacrilegious, I thought wouldn't how much better it would have been if they had stopped singing, stopped preaching, stopped enjoying church, and closed the meeting and gone downstairs they had keys and released people and just as i was beginning to feel weren't these people terrible and then ushered into the minibus that was taking me to this you know tourist destination to take to my hotel i think you know with all the the blessing that the west has had and all the moves of the holy spirit that we enjoy and all the bible studies we've attended you know, I think one of the greatest challenges for the Pentecostal and Charismatic Church today is how much more blessing do we need when around about as people, and now this may sound a little bit, you know, I don't know, sentimental, I hope, I hope not. I, I, I can't express to you how my life was impacted by asking myself the question, amongst all the blessing that we have, is the church good about going with the key that we have, it's called the Word of God, and reaching people who haven't found Christ, who are enslaved, not by iron chains, but by addictions and by habits and, and, you know, by broken relationships who haven't yet heard the gospel. And I think, wow, as much as I enjoy church, as much as I enjoy hunger for revival, should not revival 
do something that doesn't just thrill me, bless me, even make me closer to Jesus, but it must do something in you and me to make us closer to people that the gospel has been designed to reach. John, you're the, the general superintendent of the, of the denomination. Mm. What do you hope to achieve in the next year, 18 months? I would like to achieve a way in which we can do what I've just expressed to you as my heart better than we do now. To, to be, uh, to translate what we enjoy in our biblical understanding, um, in our experiences of God into our communities, that the church does a better job at taking the message out and being church in areas where, you see, church can become a blessing, the building can become a blessing box to us. And what does that mean? Well, it can be a place where that we enter into this rectangular shape, if you will, and experience our blessing, get our teaching. And, you know, the, the walls need to increasingly come down. And, and right across the church, in various denominations, people have a hunger for a church without walls, a church that is not limited to its Sundays. And we know that's the case. We know that's the case. We know that the real church isn't the buildings. We've known that for, for generations, uh, that it's, the church is the body of people where we are, but that we can be better at being salt and light. One of the great dangers, the Mount of Transfiguration was a huge moment for, uh, for you know, Jesus and the three disciples. And Peter said, Lord, let's build a booth, one for you, one for Moses. Let's enjoy, let's somehow, let's somehow box in the blessing and uh, always come back to this place where we had this encounter, where we saw people from the Old Testament. And the Bible says he did not know what he was saying. And uh, fortunately, he didn't build a booth on the mountain, because if it did, it would be a tourist attraction today. Come and have a look where the blessing was. And the reason why it wasn't right to build a booth there was at the foot of the mountain, as you read the gospel further, was a, a demon-possessed boy in the darkness, in the pain. And th the... The measure of church today is how good are we, and I say that specifically and particularly to the churches that I represent, how good are we of taking down the encounter with God to the place where the encounter isn't? And the danger is building the booth. The danger is this is where I go for my blessing, for my resource. But the criteria that Jesus wants us to use is taking that into the dark place. And I think we're going to be measured and judged by how well church in general does that. So all those years ago when you were a lad of six, mm. you believed that you, you, you'd seen the Lord and your whole life has been a, a pastor, a lot more administration now. Do you still have this huge heart to do what you do? If you had your time over again, would you change anything? No, I, I'd, I'd want to be obedient to whatever call God puts upon my life. And I, I do have a, a responsible role within my denomination and it's a great privilege. And yet I do believe that even though I talk about my call, if a person is in business and that's where God wants them, then they're fulfilling the call of God. If they're a teacher, if they're a nurse, um, if, they're a, if they're in the police force, if they're working in a factory, if that's where God wants them, then they have a ministry which is every bit as important as those of us who stand behind microphones in churches. And that, you know, that, sound, that can sound a little bit patronising and condescending in one way, but when the church realises that, and when we realise that I am where I am because God, as a believer, if I'm in the centre of God's will for my life, then God wants to use me where I am. He wants to grow me in my faith where I am. I'm going back to the building bigger people feel. And then church really begins to be church. John Glass, thank you so much for joining us on UCB. Great to be with you, Gary. Thank you. Our guest on Hearts Wide Open today has been the General Superintendent of the Elam Pentecostal Movement here in the United Kingdom, John Glass. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Thank you very much for joining us here on UCB.